Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. It's such an honor to be here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. I was here for the groundbreaking some years ago, and to be back here now and again um, and see what this institute has become is really moving to me. My name's Susan Hackley, and um, this panel, uh, War Changes Everyone, The Hidden Costs of War at Home and Abroad, uh, came about because of a project I've been really dedicating a lot of my uh, free time over the past three years to. And it came about because I feel that we don't have good conversations about war in the US and that by bringing peace builders and veterans and active service members together uh, we could then be part of a joint conversation the next time there is a lead up to war. Uh, we've been at war in the U.S. for 15 years, and what I'm going to be talking about, and then my fellow panelists are going to speak as well, I'm going to be talking about um, the impact of war in the U.S. Uh, we've been at war for 15 years, and that war is largely invisible to most of us. But it's very visible to a lot of people who have um, soldiers in the war, and of course, it's horrifically visible to the people of Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, I don't begin to speak for the suffering and the disruption and the, the, um, the horrible consequences of war there. I'm just going to be speaking about my own experience. So we each are going to speak for um, about 15 minutes. This feels weird. Um, I have with me my friend, Robert Dubois. He's on the advisory board of my project, and I'll introduce him more uh, fully later. And then um, this wonderful new friend, uh, Kitam Al, Al Kani, who works here at the USIP and is Iraqi, and we'll hear from her as well about her experiences. So uh, we'll talk, and then we'll have time for, for Q&A. And so I'd like to start by telling, deal with that. Is that okay? I'd like to start by telling my own story. First of all, um, who here is either active duty service member or a veteran? Who? Welcome. And, um, but who here has a family member who has been in the service and is a veteran? Everybody else, I, I think. Yeah, so this is something we all share. So my, um, my job is at the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. I'm the managing director of a wonderful inter-university program that deals with helping people negotiate more effectively, solve problems, build relationships, and, and bring about peace. Uh, I've also served on the Alliance for Peacebuilding Board. I was chairman of the board a number of years ago, so I'm very, very connected to this community and love this community very much. I um, also co-founded an internet company, and that was a really interesting set of experiences that taught me to um, want to innovate more. And um, I've worked as a writer and photographer for many years in Alaska. So that's sort of who I am. Nearly every time I come to Washington, I visit the Vietnam War Memorial. Um, my college boyfriend, William Earl Foster Jr., died in Vietnam in 1968, and I always want to go and pay homage to him. His death was a personal trauma to me. Uh, another veteran just entered the room, Chris Holshek. So, uh, you know, have at least three. So, uh, but it was also a trauma for this country, right? Anybody who is old enough to remember that, it really tore the U.S. apart. Everyone was affected by it. Everyone either knew a young man who was getting drafted or um, knew a family that was affected by that. And it was a huge trauma for this country. I didn't ever think we'd go through that particular kind of trauma again. Um, but years later, my son Zach decided to join the Marine Corps. And uh, I was upset because he was putting off college. And I thought, why don't you join the Peace Corps? Or why don't you wait till after college and, and join the service? But he wanted to join. It was the year 2000. And if you can remember, 
that was a very peaceful time here in the U.S. I did not for a minute ma imagine that he would be going to war. It just never crossed my mind. So um, lo and behold, in 2003, he was among the first Marine infantry into uh, over the border from Kuwait and into Iraq. And as, as I went through that build up to the war in Iraq, as a mother of uh, a soldier of a Marine, it's very painful. You don't really feel like you can speak out against the war as candidly as you would because your, your child is, is going into that war. But it was painful for me as a peace builder as well because I felt like our whole community was marginalized and not listened to. I saw very, very few voices uh, in the media of our community speaking out against the war. So um, I resolved, whether my son came home safely or not, that I would try to do something personally so that the next time our country is uh, hurrying to get into a war, it felt hurrying to me, that I would help to make our community be more a part of that discussion. So um, my son did come home safely. Uh, he's now an Alaska State Trooper and a pilot, and he's very happy. So that was a happy ending for me. But the way I decided to go about this was to create a project. I call it A Child's Guide to War. And it's a whole campaign uh, which is going to focus on listening to American children talk about what it's like. We've been at war their whole lives. Two million of them have a parent who's been at war. And uh, in eight years, a 10-year-old can vote or join the military. So it's a way of getting into that discussion with adults, because many of us have children or they're children we know and love. And what should we be doing to prepare them? But my overall goal is to help bridge the civilian military divide. I feel that um, many Americans, many peace builders, are pretty ignorant of the military. I hear all these things. I heard somebody yesterday say, well, only poor people join the military. It's just not true. And, and there are all these um, examples of not knowing each other. So I'm, as a mother of a Marine and a peace builder, I'm trying to bridge that divide. So I'm going to show you a six minute film. Where is Durva? There she is. I show you. A, thank you. A six-minute film. I've, I've. This is part of a larger project. I did. I've done a lot of filming in Indiana, and these are children in a room in Indiana, asking other children what it's like to have your mother or dad go to war. like when you first saw your parents after they came home? I was just like really happy that he was home finally and when I saw him I just started jumping up and down. Excited that she was back and I just wanted to hug her and start everything all over before she left again. What did you miss most about your parents when they were gone? I missed her voice and her hugs and her kisses. I just missed him like cheering for me and stuff in the stands the way that she used to um, do everything for us, like help us with our homework, and like help us do the chores. I did the dishes and I helped clean the house, and I, that was my first time I started doing the laundry. Are there things that you will just trigger you and you'll immediately think about your parents? I will go into her room and see that like her bed is made up and her room is clean, and just remember that she's not here. Like if you wrote a letter and you wrote back and you didn't hear from him for a while, it kind of made me worry because I didn't know what was happening to him. You sometimes worry about them, like if they're still over there or if they're somewhere else and you don't know it. How did you focus on like sports and school? Some days I was thinking about my dad more than others, but my best friend Isabel, she talked with me sometimes at recess and she made me feel better. I just put the, the thoughts on the, on the, like the side for a second and just try to get everything done first, and then I can worry about it later. Does it bother you, or does it comfort you when, like, your friend or something says, oh, my parent can substitute for your parent while he or she is away? 
my friend's dad, he was always there asking me if you want to throw the football or if you want to work on any of your skills or anything. So that comforted me a lot. Like, they, there's no explanation for why they're not talking to you or, like, answering, like, your, like, calls or anything. Like, how do you guys deal with that? I just usually think that he's probably doing something important and he has his mind on other things that he needs to get done. I just really respect everyone who joins the Army because going out to fight like that, it'd just be very hard because there's so much violence everywhere. I think we all live in our own little bubble. Like, we don't want to believe that people are getting hurt and, you know, there are people dying every day. I think it's actually really hard for a lot of people to witness stuff like that. He, he warned me that there was some stuff that he probably couldn't tell me because I'd be, like, freaked out about it. There's these people before him who are driving in Humvee, and there's like a mine, and it kind of exploded. But it didn't hurt anybody, but he was still worried that it was going to happen to him. I feel like being in war would be like a really traumatic experience. So like, it would change your life. Like afterwards, you wouldn't be the same. You would just be like scared and stressed out all the time. Some people at my school asked, if he's ever killed anybody or like hurt anybody and that just makes me mad because it's kind of a personal question to ask and it's not very respectful to him or the family because my dad's really not like a killer so I wouldn't think of him like that. Have they ever hurt somebody for good on purpose? Um, it kind of hurts when they ask that because I don't really know what's going on over there and I can't really tell if she's okay or if she's, like, badly injured. Would you ever consider going off to war? Yeah, I would like to join the military. Just in the respect for the country and my dad, so I can, like, walk in his footsteps. For me, it's really scary, and I wouldn't really want to risk it. And I think that my dad is really brave because a lot of people wouldn't want to sign up for doing something like to going going to war and he did i have my own plans for my future and i don't want to mess that up my mom's away a lot and uh not spending time with a lot with us and i don't want to do that to my kids um i was really glad to learn about um how like um kids whose parents are in the war how they like think and how they can deal with stuff it's good to know like what's happening and how it affects other people's lives and it'll help other people who are not here understand better because they really need to know so um thank you um i'd love to just hear a couple of very quick reactions what did you feel or Thank you. And one of the things I've learned from this is children of Holocaust victims, children of soldiers, children of tragedy suffer secondary PTSD. And, and, and you're right, it's just invisible. What else? Yes. James? Oh, yeah. And I think every soldier gets asked that, right? When you come back? Yes. Yes. Last question, then we'll move on.
Yes. And, and just a final thought is, in doing this work, I've talked to children of Vietnam veterans, of World War II veterans, and there's this code of silence very often among uh, people who return from war, uh, who can't, who won't, who don't want to talk about it, and the family members who are afraid to ask. And so I think in a lot of ways, it, it can be healthy to have those conversations. And now I'm going to have the great pleasure of introducing Rob Dubois, former Navy SEAL uh, who's worked in 36 countries. He's now an advisor who was labeled a smart power authority while working with coalition leaders in Baghdad. He advises Congress on the importance of foreign assistance for U.S. national security. He's the author of a wonderful book you should all get, uh, Powerful Peace, A Navy SEAL's Lessons on Peace from a Lifetime of War. He's the founder of Impact Actual Consulting, uh, and he's currently featured in the National Geographic Channel's six-week series, which is ongoing now, Migrations, a Human Herd Attempts to Cross the Serengeti on Foot. Welcome, Rob. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm going to try and give you uh, amplified volume, uh, but at the right distance, I'm not yeah. choking on it, and you're not choking on my voice. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the, um, the tactical, operational, and strategic, if you will, distances of this issue. The tactical, the immediate, is my family, and uh, the next is the interaction between my family and the society or other military kids in society, other families in society. And ultimately, uh, without stopping too much on Kadam's area, talk about the, uh, you know, the families of our enemies. They have families too. Um, with a quick aside on that note, uh, we're talking, I, I just heard the, the, disc the talking point of um, Generations of war, and I'll, as I said, I'll come back to that. But the uh, the distant uh, the distant enemy and his family is something we don't consider. I mean, they're faceless enemies. They have you know horns. They have laser beams coming out of their eyeballs, and they're not human. We have to dehumanize in order to fight somebody and kill them. That's the general policy. Not for seals. Seals don't need that because seals are trained to a level of doing the job when it needs to get done. And we recognize the dirty work as being part of a critical global process because sometimes you have to commit, you know, have to do a surgery on a cancer. The body of, the, of humanity is like a, an organism and it can get sick and it can have ISIL uh, pop up in it. And you have to sometimes kill a guy because that guy's going to saw the head off of a woman in the streets of Baghdad, as happened. To a fellow, uh, his, his mom was sawn in part uh, in front of the whole neighborhood when a very bad man was released because somebody paid $5,000 to the local guard to get him out. The Iraqi captain let this very bad man go. He went back, got his posse. They went to the man, the snitch's house, uh, grabbed up the snitch and his brother, and uh, took, I think, uh, altogether there were seven men that were captured. And the, the woman, his mom, the, they started with her. Uh, forced the whole village to come out and watch what happens to the mothers of snitches and they decapitated her in front of the families of the village. And then they took the men away and tortured them until they all died except for one. And I say, I, I emphasize that in my book too, it is possible to torture somebody until he dies. It's not an execution, it's a torturing until you're dead. They get the one guy who was, who was clinging to life and dragged him back and threw him in the street and said, go tell everybody what you saw. This is what we're dealing with. This is war. This is not theoretical stuff. This is not some nonsense about, you know, um, well, we should just try to reason with everybody. Uh, I'm the biggest uh, advocate of reason, uh, biggest advocate of peace. I'm a Yusuf alum, basically. I'm here all the time in the past few years. I have referenced uh, individuals from Yusuf in my book about empowering women and the power of, uh, of a, you know, a, a, a stabilized society like, like we're talking about here. You know, I, I'm called up to Congress to talk about uh, foreign assistance. How does it help us stop terrorism? And there's always the debates. The theoreticians love to talk about, well, poverty doesn't cause terrorism because Muhammad Atta wasn't poor. 
I want to grab people like that and I get another one like that and conk them together like coconuts and say, listen, this is not that simple. Muhammad Atta wasn't poor, so what? And many, many people are coming from poor societies that are fragmented and where communication is, is limited to what you hear from the next guy. And outside of both Baghdad and Kabul bases, I've, I've known of insurgents talking to the local forces and a local population, good innocent people, green forces or white forces, however you want to identify them. Uh, compared to the blue and the red forces that are out there duking it out, but they'll talk to these guys and say, you know what, well, your daughter has you know, dysentery and you only get three hours of power a day, but before the invaders came you had five hours of power a day? It's because they're stealing your power. Look up on the base. They're playing basketball at 2 a.m. and drinking lattes from the, from the green bean coffee machine, which is true. We are drinking lattes at 2 a.m. because we worked 12 hours before that and just got off work. And some of the guys are playing basketball under floodlights, but it's generated at a huge cost by American gas or uh, gas that's, that's uh, shipped in from Europe at four or five times the cost of gas uh, in America, more than it's, than it's worth. So you see layer after layer of waste here, and the worst part about all that waste is we're exhausting ourselves to make sure we have high quality gas coming in, uh, and, and we have to have morale high enough to manage the war and keep maintaining whatever, what pressure we need against the guys who are going to saw the heads off of women. Uh, but the reality is you can take those simple facts, twist them around, and say they're stealing your power, and that's why your daughter's dying right now in the heat, because she can't get air conditioning in your house. So it's complex. There's nothing easy about this, but I promise to come back to the, to the near. I was with my, my family formed in 1993, and by 2008, 15 years later, we calculated on my anniversary that I've been gone for eight years. When my grandpa kicked the bucket about eight years ago, I was talking to him and grandma on the last days, and I learned that they had been apart for one night in 50 years. They couldn't comprehend my life, and I couldn't comprehend their life. I have three children. The impact on the kids of being in a military family is complex. That's what this is all about. That's this whole discussion. The movie is all about that. It's complex. Kids are so proud, or try to be so proud of their parents who are serving. The, I say try to be because if you picture the vulnerable little organism that is a kid with the vulnerable little psychology of a kid, that kid can do the best possible job, three or four or five or eight years old, of rationalizing what he's supposed to understand about why daddy or mommy is serving overseas, but that kid cannot ever grasp it, because that kid is not 18 or 28 or 58. That kid is eight, and all that kid knows is mommy needs to take care of me. So you have underlying issues of abandonment that exist. In the case of my family, where daddy was abandoning them, calling it what it is, you know, I'm not... I'm not condemning myself. I'm simply identifying what, it, what the experience is for the child is abandonment. It's real. Let's call it what it is. Let's have a no-crap conversation today and every day for the rest of my life, God willing. It feels like that, and that lays on anxieties, insecurities, and so forth, especially when the child shames him or herself for having those negative feelings about daddy or mommy. How complex is that? I shouldn't be mad about this. I shouldn't be resentful about this. Kids from military families are oftentimes of a higher caliber of a sense of citizenship. There's these great memes you'll see online about kids playing basketball on a military base, and when uh, when co colors is sounded, when the 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 music goes over the base to bring the flag down, the kids drop the ball. They stand at attention. They respect the flag. And you're not going to see that on almost any, any other campus in America. That's a, a positive aspect of it. But like I mentioned, there are psychological currents that are complex, and they all have this interplay. There's secondary tertiary effects inside the child's mind. And so when a person who's five or eight feels conflicted, what do they do? They, it's called acting out. Simple stuff. I'm not a kid psychologist, but I have kids, and I have military kids. And acting out is a thing kids do to try and get attention. And my caveman understanding of, of things like ADHD or attention deficit, I've always wondered what 
how much is it possible that uh, the syndrome of attention deficit has been influenced in America by the division of attention from the parental units to the children who are in need and they seek to get attention because they have a deficit of attention that they need. I'm not saying mom has to stay home and can't get a job. I'm saying that's, you know, again, a no crap conversation about what we really are, who we really are today. Neither judging it, saying good or bad. Simple ob observation because when we understand what the objective facts are, we can start to make adjustments, little adjustments that make big downstream effects. So when kids act out, they get in trouble. Unless the system that they're working with, the institution of the school or the church organization or whatever they're doing, whoever's working with them, when those people understand the complexity of the child of the military family, then they can say, you know, maybe Johnny was slamming erasers across the room. Let's look at the, the, the whys behind that. Um, and I'm not into coddling. That shouldn't surprise anybody. I am into understanding people, human beings, because every human being, eight years old or 98 years old, deserves respect, in my opinion. If we had a lot more respect on the planet, we'd have a lot less war, a lot less need for SEALs. So when that kid is, I'm, I'm going to talk about solutions, but I'm talking about the issues first. The solutions include addressing that issue of the kids acting out because the kid feels bad, that the kid, kid isn't getting the, the love and attention he feels like he needs. The mom or dad staying home is maxed out doing two jobs. That it's, it's a single parent family in every sense of the word when mom or dad is gone, except that when mom or dad is gone in, um, in, uh, in a, a separation, a normal American standard separation of the family, of the, of the two parents, the, uh, the kids have all the issues of, you know, sense of neglect or abandonment that happens. Again, calling it what it is. It hurts for a kid to be part of a divided family. Uh, I was one, and I'm speaking from experience. But that does not, that all too, un unfortunately, all too common experience in America does not include watching the TV and seeing a former SEAL get burned alive in a car, dragged from said car, dragged through the streets, and then hung from a bridge in Fallujah upside down. So his legs splayed all one way and his body's charred beyond recognition. That's what military kids see on TV. And unlike the kids who are from regular old fashioned divorce families, their dad might be the next one. My wife couldn't comprehend watching the news after that because I was in Fallujah when it happened. She didn't know and neither did any other SEAL wife in the world what SEAL that was because all the news said was Four men were killed and one was a SEAL. After that, she couldn't watch the news and she couldn't not watch the news. It was like this. Every night, she and Kelly, her girlfriend, Rick and I were both away and they, they were just both, you know, I mean, how do you, how do you grieve in advance? That's what it feels like. You gotta grieve in advance or kind of get staged, you know, get pre-positioned for, for the grieving process. And it hurt. So <clears throat> there's two things I want to touch on from the video. Dad killed someone. Did your dad kill someone? Have you killed someone? Uh, and I would like to I would like to sensitively address everybody who's not in the military, especially with the military, on that issue because I don't. Unlike many people, I don't call everybody an idiot. You don't understand this. You're an idiot. I don't believe that. I believe that if you don't understand it, you, you don't understand it. It hasn't been conveyed to you in an understandable way yet. And so I want, I want to tr convey all things that I say in an understandable way and say, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, we're not uh, characters in a movie, although I am on TV right now. Uh, migrations is spelled with a Y. My, like personal, because we're a human herd migrating across the Serengeti, trying not to get killed. And uh, it's amazing, Monday nights. National Geographic, <coughs> but um, it's on their site too. Anyway, enough plugging. Uh, we're not characters in a movie. We're not Chuck Norris doing his thing. Who, you know, he served in the military, but most actors haven't. Uh, we are human beings, and I, I love this reference. When I first uh, was going to my team in Hawaii, I saw an interview in the paper, the local paper. A, a young woman interviewed the the command uh, commanding officer and the command master chief the top enlisted and the top officer, commissioned people at the SEAL team, both old war dogs. And they, uh, she said at the end, you know, you both 
you both remind me of somebody I don't want to tell you this because you might get mad at me but but sir you remind me of my uncle to the commander and um, I, I my uncle wouldn't hurt a fly and Master Chief, forgive me for this, but you remind me of my grandpa. My grandpa's a sweetie. And the Master Chief said, well, it's like this. We're human beings first. We go to PTA meetings. We take out the trash. We have to mow the lawn. We're human beings first. Sometimes something has to be done, and somebody's got to go do it. When that happens, we reach across the wall to the switch, flick it on, and we're in that mode and we go do the things that have to be done. And they're dirty and hard and nobody else can do them, but they must be done. So nobody else gets his mom's head sawn off in front of the neighborhood. And when we get done with our dirty work, we flick the switch and we go to a PTA meeting. And all I want to do is sensitize the community. That's what this project is all about. Sensitize the community about the humanness about the military kids. And I'd like to see, as my final comment about solutions, I'd like to see I'd like to see deliberate programs in schools to take, you know, we have ethnic recognition, we have other group recognition through the year, there's the month for this, the month for that, why not be, you know, Veterans Day, it's a military month, why not do programs at schools, but don't be careful about bringing out, uh, highlighting the kids who are military, give them a voice, let them be heard, have dialogues, you know, what's it like, so that way the non-military kids and the military kids can all have a conversation and say, yeah, here's my experience just like those kids, but this is a real whole thing. And then everybody understands everybody, and nobody has horns or laser beams coming out of their eyes. It's all human beings with shared experiences, except for the kids that are afraid of their dad hanging from a bridge in Fallujah at that time, and the, the kids who just had their dad hung from a bridge in Fallujah at that time. It's complex because it's sensitive, and you have to think about everybody's needs. It has to be said. The conversation has to happen, or we're not going to move forward with the kids and the, and the dialogue between the military and the civilian. But it must be said with great care. Thank you. And, and um, one thing I learned in making this film was these children, their teachers did not know their parents were serving in Iraq or Afghanistan. And that seemed crazy to me that the parents hadn't said that. But um, And with the reserves and so many um, soldiers who aren't part of a, um, a base, then they're, they're largely invisible. So any quick thoughts or comments? Um, on, on Rob, what Rob had to say before we move on. Yes. huge, critical. I, I spoke with every person of influence I could get, from our congressmen to, uh, to commanders of military units in the U.S. and abroad for the U.S. and other foreign governments. I talked, you know, I, I was a liaison officer to the, to the Brits and the, the Iraqis, excuse me, in Basra and Baghdad and various places. I used to sit with one guy who was the liaison officer, this General uh, Abbas, to uh, to, he was the uh, liaison officer from the Iraqi forces to General Petraeus when we were in Baghdad. And he and I would have drink juice and talk, and he said, you know, it, it's all about respect. It, if, if our guys don't feel respected by the Americans, and they don't, and very, common, very commonly, um, uh, then uh, we, you will not get our best. It will not be a good relationship. It won't even be a good, uh, you know, pragmatic team effort because the Iraqis are always being looked at like something other than what they are, equal you know, men of, of honor, men of strength, men of uh, military capacity. Um, and by no means am I indicting all American soldiers. I will be very clear on this. Not all American soldiers look down on Iraqi soldiers. And I'll be very clear that some American soldiers do look down on Iraqi soldiers. And let's be honest, for God's sake. Let's just be honest once and for all. That's how these conversations move forward. And that's what we have to do. We have to say, you, dude, stop this. 
Uh, General, um, the guy who's in charge of uh, CENTCOM now, I think. Or no, he might be the chief of staff. I uh, can't remember his name all of a sudden. Uh, General, huge guy. Uh, he, sorry? Not Votel, no. Um, Austin, General Austin, posted a thing in the dining facility. You see this in my book, Powerful Peace. I talked about dignity and respect. These are huge things for me. And on this poster was dignity and respect in giant letters. Not in my army, talking about racial discrimination, ethnic discrimination, religious discrimination, you know, international discrimination. And he w it was a bold statement from the general about how we will, you know, act with dignity and respect toward other people, all people, so that we can move the ball forward in this war and actually stop the bad guys, not create new bad guys among ourselves. Everybody's going to become bad guys against other guys. And uh, and in that same dining facility, I walked up to the dining to the um, to the uh, to the to the serving line, and the fellow behind the counter, I think it was Pakistani, he was serving this one big American dude. Big white American dude who was waiting for three orders right now, styrofoam. He gave him different orders. He wanted, you know, corned beef on this one or whatever on this one. And he was acting like this and looking at the guy like he's a dog. And the kid, the young man's just trying to serve it up. And, uh, and he got more and more offensive. The American got more and more offensive and just kind of being a, a can I say a dick in here? <laughs> uh, <coughs> too late. And... And finally, the guy's like stressing, and I'm, I'm behind him. I'm like, hey, you know, chill out. Don't give him too much stress. The guy's finally this, this big, dumb American grabbed these two boxes and walked on down. And the guy's still trying to fill the third one. And he hustled down to catch up to him. And he says, here you go, sir. Here you go, sir. And um, he opened it up and said, and I quote, I said barbecue pork. Like a small child who's never been spanked. And I was so disgusted. And I thought about my time right after 9-11. I was clearing certain beaches for the invasion of Afghanistan. I was doing missions that were in certain countries where people might have been Pakistani, theoretically, rhetorically speaking. And these guys saved my ass. They kept me alive. They watched and covered me while I did my mission. And these men would, would give their lives for me it's not about who's from what nationality, who has what passport. It's about dignity and respect across all color, shape, size, language issues. And, uh, and, and that's what we, I mean, the posters can't make that happen. The same base, this, a different general, General Moffat, who's in charge, he was the J2, he's in charge of all Iraqi intelligence. I sat in meetings with him every week or two, and he would say every week or two, your men are disrespecting my officers. So you have E3s and E4s disrespecting O3s and O4s, young officers, young smart officers. They would call them ragheads and things like that in front of them, thinking they don't speak English. These guys get, just got back from training in, uni in universities in America and speaking English quite fluently, thank you very much. They're being called ragheads in their own country, in their own headquarters, by these junior enlisted people who had no place uh, behaving that way toward any officer or any person. It's frustrating to me. You probably couldn't tell. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. And um, I'm, I'm very happy now to introduce Kitam al Kane is a program officer with rule of law, justice, and security here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. She's part of the team who put together a wonderful book that I commend to all of you, Speaking Their Peace, Personal Stories from the Front Lines of War and Peace. Uh, born in Iraq, attended university in Iraq, many years in Iraq, um, many years in a war environment, um, as she described to me this morning. In 2003, Katam became a coordinator for the coalition forces in Baghdad, providing humanitarian assistance for Iraqi detainees. Uh, following her promotion to cell chief of the detention section at the Iraqi Assistance Center, she joined USIP as a program specialist. In 2011, she transitioned into the role of Justice and Security Dialogue Field Officer in Iraq within the Rule of Law Program. And this program works to build relationships between um, police and civil society. So um, in post-conflict countries, we're so happy to have you here. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's such great honor to be among a um, lovely audience um, like you. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to touch upon uh, the war hitting costs and um, 
Um, it's always a question that we all raise. Um, does the war end or stop? It's easily, it's always easily um, and strongly welcomed uh, to accept uh, war, um, um, th the stop um, point of, of the war, but um, uh, could it be uh, tolerated? Like it's always easier to welcome and accept uh, ending of war, but is it easier uh, to be tolerated? That's that's the question. And if it's not um, easy to tolerate uh, to tolerate war, does it really end, or the war? It's just it, it just stop. Um, the the war. Um, I think for someone like me who lived his entire life um, through wars, um, I guess I I was talking to Susan this morning. I guess I. I get to enjoy, um, in my entire life, I got to enjoy about four and a half years of peace. Uh, a year and a half was transitioning from the Iraqi, Iranian war to the Iraqi, um, uh, Kuwaiti war. So it wasn't real peace. It was another preparation for another war. But at least it was somehow pretended peace um, in Iraq. And uh, the other three years is, uh, of peace that I lived is when I moved to DC um, and back in uh, 2013. Um, war is, is um, beyond the spending dollars. It's, it's more of, it's, it's beyond destroying facilities. It's beyond um, um, uh, confronting the enemy at, at uh, certain lines or at the borders. It's about death. It's about injuries. It's about destruction um, among the community, destruction of the society, destruction of the psychology, um, destruction of the um, uh, psychology of the um, uh, newborn generation. And it's um, lots of unintended um, uh, consequences that can um, um, go on for decades. Um, the physical damage of war, such as um, what's happening for properties or even institutions across the world, um, it could be easily uh, forgotten by time. But again, and um, I, I would echo my uh, colleague Robert here, it's so tough um, uh, to forget the humiliation uh, of human dignity and, and, and faith. And that's where um, really um, uh, the hidden cost of war will keep war going uh, for at least um, two generations, if not, if not, uh, if not more. Um, um, living and, and when I think of um, enjoying like quite some years of peace and specifically I would highlight um, my years living in, in, in US is it real peace when whenever I turn on the TV and I see active shooting or I, I just follow the news and I um, see um, uh, ISIL threats uh, global threats is it is it real peace that I'm living or am I living another period of fear uh, from living another like um, uh, conflict and um, undefined type of conflict yet? Uh, I will touch upon a few um, major factors that um, from my personal experience um, and from my professional experience, I could highlight as uh, the hidden costs. Uh, for war, uh, one major uh, hidden cost is losing uh, trust. Once um, uh, trust is lost, here come the monster of fear. So you, that would turn your life upside down. Um, as a con uh, as um, a consequence of conflict, especially uh, on children and 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 um, young people, it can easily they can easily once they they lost their trust then um, they can easily lose their uh, confidence in the society, in their environment, uh, even um, in their family, as well as their future. Um, they often, and then as, as an impact of, of losing trust and losing confidence in, your, in yourself, in your family, in your future, um, those young, young kids and, and young generation, uh, they could be either anxious um, or they could be um, um, a fearful, um, um, a weak uh, generation, or they could be so aggressive generations. Um, and that's where the high risk um, is, is really 
um, kind of like uh, it's a it's a it's a, a, a thin thread between being like um, um, escape or a, a threat type of a, a, a personality or a very aggressive because both can turn into um, a, a massive bombs in their in their society. So once uh, trust disappears, people morale normally get down, and and uh, many of the unexpected behaviors became um, uh, accepted and became um, a daily um, a norm and became the type of life uh, that the new generation is living. Um, once losing the trust um, made or um, kind of like the status of, of losing uh, the trust could lead to another major factor, which is changing the fabric of the society. Uh, when people get scared, and um, uh, especially families with kids, um, when, when they get scared, they, the first thing they would think about is changing their environment, seeking for another less fearful, uh, more secure environment. Uh, more trusted environment, and then they decide they decide to go to a new unknown desti destinations, and uh, that is the start point of breaking their social binding. So they have to deal with um, uh, strange and new fir form perceptions among the new community that they're joining, um, and then the start is living with a strange community, either by perception or by environment. So living. Um, the strange aspect of the new life is, is a huge uh, turn point in, in, in people's life, um, and, and that could be highlighted and, and labeled as uh, another major factor of the hidden um, cost of the war. Um, so you might lose what makes you part of the community, starting with losing um, your original identity. Uh, for example, um, and, and through um, managing uh, the justice and security program with the USIP, I get to uh, deal with IDPs. Uh, they're Iraqis, but they moved, uh, they're an internal displaced persons who moved from province or from city to another, or from village to another village within the same, uh, within the same province. And um, I'll give you an example of, of how people like, how, how the, how the changing of the societal fabric started. Uh, I met, um, I think, 10 kids um, uh, while I was doing um, um, my uh, tour across Iraq. Uh, they were IDPs, and I, was, I started conversation with them away from the formal um, dialogue session, and uh, we were out in the garden, and um, we start talking, and I asked them, so um, are you going to school? And they were like, yes, we're going to the IDP uh, school. So the first thing, they labeled themselves as an IDP. So they labeled themselves as a stranger in this community. And then there was a moment of silence because uh, this really hurt me. I mean, it's, it's so tough to see a kid like eight years old who um, you know, use new identity for himself, labeling himself as um, uh, an IDP. And then there was another kid who jumped in to say like, well, we go to this school because the other school people start calling us ISIL, and we don't want to be called as an ISIL. We are an IDPs. <clears throat> so he started defending his new identity as his preferred uh, identity than being called as an enemy from his own uh, country. But none of them mentioned or labeled um, um, himself as an Iraqi. None of them. And, and that's where the, the, the fabric of the community start to really get changed. And, and it's, it's so uh, uh, horrifying. And it's, 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 high, it's, it's high risk that we really need to pay attention to early on. Um, it's internal displaced persons. Sure. And even in defensive war, like for example, um, uh, the war uh, against Al-Qaeda that took place in, in Iraq, where the Iraqi government um, uh, led um, uh, joint, joint um, uh, military operations with the um, uh, US military back in 2009, uh, that, that war even generated 
um, it has a consequences and generated um, uh, uh, a new neglected and rejected generation. For example, um, by the neglected and um, rejected generation, I'm referring to the sons of um, um, the sons who born uh, by a forced marriage uh, to Iraqi women uh, by um, uh, a qaeda, one of the Al Qaeda fighters. That in, in certain places in Iraq, women were forced to marry um, uh, Al Qaeda fighters, and um, uh, they got they got kids. And those could those kids up to this speaking moments are stateless generation. The government is not willing to um, uh, touch that uh, issue because they don't want to. Uh, they don't know how to handle it. It has lots of community uh, sensitivity, and it has lots of. Uh, implications on the system. So the easiest way to deal with the problem is just get into a denial status and um, uh, avoid dealing with that issue. Uh, the same thing applies for uh, IDPs, um, uh, newborn IDPs, um, or among IDPs. And again, the Iraqi government unable to verify that those are um, uh, real, pure Iraqi citizens because it happened um, during the, the time that ISIL uh, in, in invaded some, some of the Iraqi territories and, and people fleeing from those territories, they lost their um, national identification and, they, uh, and they, they just cannot register their kids. Uh, so the hidden co consequences, um, uh, these are hidden consequences and hidden costs for the war is the creation of a new rejected generation within the same community or within the same country. Um, that's beside uh, the cost of um, a, a sexual abuse for women, and uh, we can go um, long and long in the list. But uh, what I realized that children, children language is so different nowadays. Um, uh, we used to uh, hear from kids uh, words like toys, games, schools, friends, all these words being replaced by abducted, killed, bombed, um, um, uh, enemy, and instead of kids' normal uh, phrase of saying, let's play together, let's make friendship together, they keep saying, just stay away from me. I don't know you. You're a stranger. I want to be by my own. So that's what really um, uh, change the, uh, ch these are factors, scary factors that changing the um, uh, the fabric of the society, and we have to really pay attention to those factors, and we don't have to keep underestimating those factors because those generation, they all they uh, they learned um, is these words: kidnapping, killing, war. That's the education they got from um, uh, from war. And some women became so protective for their kids, and they have to drop them out of school because basically either they are so afraid that they're gonna go and they're not gonna come back because of a random shooting, ex um, 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 a car bomb, or they could be kidnapped. Second, they cannot afford secure transportation that can uh, take them back and forth to the school uh, and they get to enjoy uh, the safety of, of, of uh, their kids on a daily basis. So they decided to drop, uh, drop them off school, even uh, in countries that have uh, a free education system. What that means, all they learned is tactics of war. All they learn is terminologies had to do with um, 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 genocide, has to do with killing people, has to do with um, being uh, enemy uh, to the community. Um, we don't have to really underestimate those factors because those factors could turn this um, um, generation into ISIL and into other unnamed um, uh, future groups. Um, the, I, I wanted to touch upon um, a very a broad level of hidden um, cost factor, which is community resistant to foreigners. Uh, the legacy of war illustrated in community fears from dealing with countries who engaged in war against them at certain time. And that's by itself is a major um, uh, obstacle, even for the government of, of post-war and post-conflict countries to really rebuild um, their uh, international policy and uh, rebuild their uh, relation with uh, international um, uh, communities just because of uh, the resistance from their own, uh, their own community. For example, it's very difficult for uh, American investors now 
to really invest in Iraq and uh, be um, um, investing their money or work directly in Iraq because of the community fears. Even if the community, they don't hate the Americans, but there is there are war proxies around, there are political agendas around that can fuel this uh, fear and turn it into uh, like real um, uh, violent reaction from the community. Um, couple of recommendations I would like to make. Um, we really need a better diplomacy that promotes a mutual understanding and, and respect for the right of self-determination. Um, it's time to really think about preventative um, uh, programs and, and uh, uh, initiatives that can bridge the peace builders um, with uh, the military, um, uh, military divisions. Um, it's time uh, to really start at least to bridge peace builders and, and, and military at the planning stage of, of ending, uh, ending the war. Um, I think one last recommendation is um, to really consider um, uh, studying, teaching, and learning the hidden cost of war, um, not just uh, keep keep avoiding um, uh, learning about it and just think of war as it's, you know, like military tactics and we're gonna hit that regime or that um, uh, extremist groups and, and we don't think beyond those uh, military tactics. So um, once we start teaching hidden costs for war, we will start really uh, be creative in um, designing preventative strategies um, in, in a collaborative way. And uh, one last thing, if you wanna hear more testimonies about um, the uh, war hidden cost, you can just uh, read this book, Speaking Their Peace. It has uh, about seven countries, people from seven countries, women, youth, um, uh, civil society, and different segments of, of, of the communities who really uh, spoke about the hidden cost of the war. Thank you for your attention, thank you. And in the book, it also has interviews with soldiers. So it's, it's really all sides of the war. Thank you so much, Kitam. So um, some, some thoughts and reactions. You said three very different um, ways of looking at this issue. Yes? Yes. Yes. Talked about um, the responses of the children. I don't level. It really does reflect what happens when you lose the issue. Life, life, or through the entire culture that wired to fight, fight, fly, or fight, flee, or freeze. Yes, and then you. Uh, you talk a little bit about the uh, identity especially with the IDP's identity, but can you explain a little bit more about the conflict, conflicting parties' identity, what they fight for, what kind of, uh, in the Iraq context? Can you explain about that? I'm sorry, are you, can you just, uh, let me rephrase your question. Are you asking about the um, conflict now in Iraq? Do you no, wanna? No, conflicting parties' identity. So there is, a, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about the, no, I, don't, I, mean, I know about the IDP's identity about children things, but that's always important when there's a conflict, there's a conflict in parties' identity, uh, 
are very important. So what were the identity and what they fight for? So, so it's still fight going on, right? You got my yes. point or no? Yes. Um, well, um, Iraq has uh, multi political parties now are, are playing a role in the, um, um, in the political uh, development and, and climate. And normally um, IDPs or people under um, direct Im impact of, of um, military operations or uh, the conflict they will, this, the best choice for them is to go and live with uh, communities. Either they share with them um, ethnic identity or uh, religion identity or at least political the least political identity but even moving to those to those communities um, you're still being um, uh, categorized as a stranger and you don't really um, there is not much of a binding between between you and them even if there is a strong uh, ethnic binding a strong um, uh, uh, religious or political um, uh, bindings but the environment, the, geo the geographic bindings is completely different. And, and uh, um, str um, I would say um, a huge country like Iraq, it, it, it's not about just about your uh, ethnic or religious or political uh, identity. It, um, it's about the geographic identity as well. That, that, that what create, that's the first step that creates the uh, strange feeling between you and the rest of the community that you ever thought you belong to them. Um, so that those are a major facts and, and major um, categories of identity in Iraq uh, where people try to navigate their uh, survival around. But it's, it's, um, it's beyond that. It's about uh, integration of, of um, uh, communities. It's, it's about acceptance of, of each other. It's about also acquisition and how much um, the, the host community perception can accept you even if you are part of their religion or their uh, um, ethnic ethnicity or you share their political affiliation, how much they can really um, uh, look at you neutrally and objectively uh, without judging you coming from that geographic uh, place. For, uh, for example, now, even uh, if we're talking about Shia coming from Mosul, which, is, uh, which was the first city under the control of, of ISIL, even Shia, uh, when, when they went to Shia community, they, they were seen as, uh, as ISIL uh, followers. And um, the evidence for that is kids start calling them ISIL in the school where kids bring those terminology from. They're bringing, them, uh, bringing those terminology from home, from their families. So it's a transfer perception that, that could change the, um, um, the perception of, of, of the new generation and keep, um, uh, uh, keep categorizing, recategorizing, and reforming the, um, uh, the, the, new, um, uh, the new generations. I don't know if that yeah, answer I, your question enough or you want to expand. We well, can let's, expand let's move on. We'll, go ahead, sir. Um, thank you for your presentations. Uh, my name's Eli. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the, the comment about dehumanization that you, I think Robert mentioned early on. Um, my, my father worked in the Pentagon for most of his life and he also confirmed to me that the training was set up um, to dehumanize others so that they could be killed and I've heard this confirmed by other soldiers and other talks um, so if that's the reality you know why are we surprised that dehumanization happens in the field and that dignity of other people is not respected um, and sort of a nuance on that is how can an institution or people claim to um, be defending human dignity while at the same time being willing to kill certain humans. Um, it might, there might be another reason or something else that's happening, but it, it doesn't seem to be consistent with the activity of, of human dignity. I'm so glad you opened that box. I am too, thank you. So oh, gonna, He's going to answer and then we'll get to you, sir. My, uh, I am a peace-loving seal not a pacifist or a peacenik. 
Um, I'm not a non-violence advocate. Uh, and I'm gonna, this, this is going somewhere. King in America, under the US rule of law, was able to non-violently sway society. And Gandhi, under the UK rule of law, was able to non-violently sway society. Seismic shifts in society by both men. And people can misunderstand that to mean that we can do that anywhere. But if you do that in downtown Kabul, under the, under the Taliban, and have a peaceful sit-down protest, you're going to have exactly as many heads laying on the side of the road as were sitting down in the road before that, because it's not conducive in certain circumstances. So the reason I say the, uh, I, I love peace, I wish we had peace all over the planet, and there's certain needs, like the guy who wants to cut off a mom's head, where we must take action, and oftentimes, uh, sometimes, in the right circumstances, that action is violence. Um, if I use this analogy, I'll, I'll post it, pose it to everyone, um, because many people in Yusuf are pacifist, uh, and I respect that. My grandfather's a pacifist. Um, I respect philosophies, approaches to living. We all have one. There's seven billion plus different philosophies on the planet. Mine is as flawed as anyone else's. Uh, but in the situation of people who flatly tell me I would never raise my hand, and even Gandhi said I wish my son would defend me with, his, with a fist or a gun if somebody's trying to hurt me badly. Uh, those who were flatly, theoretically refused to use violence in any situation, I pose the idea that there's a 300-pound man right now raping a three-year-old child viciously right now, and he's uh, resistant any, any, you know, moving him around you may want to use. And there's a gun right there. Would you stop that brutal attack, including possibly the killing of the child, by that man in that certain situation? And if the answer is yes, if each person searches his or her heart and says yes, even though I'm a pacifist, then we have the beginning of the answer to the question of how can you talk about human dignity like it matters and be willing to use violence. I will kill anyone who walks in that door. I'm not armed, to be clear. Uh, theoretically, I would kill anyone who walks in that door with a vest on and a plunger in his hand intent on blowing himself right there. Not because he's going to whack me, because he's going to whack her. And he's going to whack her. Part of her body, part of my body will shield her when he, when he detonates right there. But you guys are taking it full in the face. You're dead. They're going to have their ears blown out right there and fragmentation will be all over them. Or I can put a bolt in his head right now and he drops. Sometimes it has to happen. And I have massive respect. I wrote chapters about dignity and respect in Powerful Peace. Because I love dignity and respect, and I've seen the Im uh, immeasurable power of simply treating people with respect. Uh, people with, uh, with, uh, with opposing views as well as mine, uh, as well as who share my view. Uh, so it's, it's, it comes down to that about the dignity and respect. And, and back to the dehumanization really quickly. Uh, the dehumanization is a global and historical, unchanging ne uh, necessity of warfare. Because sometimes, you know, uh, war is diplomacy uh, by other means. We sometimes you must have a, an army go forward because there's another army called Hitler's army, and it's going to erase all the people who are Jews, gays, and and uh, and Russians in in the continent. And you you put a big force against them, and so the dehumanization process is just an unfortunate necessity. And my GI friends will understand because you can't take a normal good human being and tell him to go kill people. It doesn't work. Just like you can't take a normal human being and tell them to run into a, a, a nest of gun, guys with guns, you have to condition those behaviors by the tens of thousands to make it happen. It's impossible otherwise. But it doesn't mean we have to de de dehumanize every person we encounter who looks different from us, like this Pakistani server who is an ally, not an enemy, behind that line from the big white American. Can I just add something and then get to you, sir? Um, as a mother, it was horrifying uh, when I realized, and I should have known a long time before that, that my son as a Marine was being trained to kill. Honestly, when he joined the Marines, I didn't think about that. And so I, <laughs> that I didn't know that? That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing exercises, right? right exactly, yes, and he so. starts telling me. And, and then um, I've heard the story about, and I don't know the statistic, but in World War I, a number, a num um, very few soldiers shot to kill. And if anybody can back this up, Chris. Um, 
because it was so hard to shoot and aim at another person. So the training then, I think, became uh, shooting, practicing at targets that looked like human beings. So they got used to shooting at something that looked like a human being. So this is, as Rob said, part of the training, um, the horrible training of learning to kill. Telecom yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this discussion. My name is Ken Dante. I've worked as a therapist and trauma and PTSD and secondary PTSD are the kind of the coins in the trade. And when I think of people who go off to war, even if it's a just war, even if it's World War II, even if it's absolutely clear, they often come back with nightmares and things that they can't integrate. They're haunted, the families suffer, comes out in divorces, shootings, other fashions. And these are not necessarily bad people. They're people who've been traumatized. In thinking of the training process you were mentioning, there's certain costs. I mean, there's a cost to going to war Moral wounding is the word they use now for complex PTSD. Initially, there were two types of PTSD. One is like a truck blows up. It's the shock of it. But the other is that there was a child, and you thought the child had a grenade, and you weren't sure, but your buddies were there. And if you did shoot, something awful was going to happen. And if you didn't shoot, something awful was going to happen. It was a devil's dilemma, but you had to make a choice. Or you had to make the shot. And even though it sits right rationally, and it sits right cognitively, and you've been trained in a certain way, late at night, those ghosts come back. I often think of PTSD as ghosts. I mean, I think of the Vietnam War. You're haunted by stuff, even though your superiors told you it was right, even though you were prepared for it, and it was part of the ethos, you're still haunted by it. Is part of the cost of going to war the fact that people will suffer moral wounds even if they are good people, is that just part of the cost of this? We're talking about the hidden I wanna, cost of it. Thank you. That is, is exactly what I'm trying to get at. Even those of us who don't go to war, who send our soldiers to war, who elect the leaders who send our soldiers, we should be bearing some of that moral burden. I feel that. It shouldn't be just borne by the soldiers. I have to remind people I know, the soldiers don't choose where to go to fight. We do. We, the American electorate. And now there's a lot of loose talk about war, and this just seems more imperative than ever that we all kind of own our wars and, and um, feel some of the pain. Of course somebody comes back from war and, and feels anguish, even if he or she made the right decisions. It's an ugly, awful, horrible business that should be a last resort, right? Chris, do you want to add anything? including head games. Either 
So I want to get that it's comment really back there. Yes, good. We have five minutes left. Thank you, Chris. I was wondering if, if there's based upon actual experience, widespread uh, on the Holocaust, <laughs> on cars, and, uh, Yes, yeah, so it's multi-generational, I've learned, and um, there are a lot of great um, psychologists working on that at Purdue, at Duke. Uh, there's a lot of good literature on that, and I think what I've learned is uh, the great-grandchild of a Holocaust victim is continuing to feel that mix of anger and shame and humiliation and fear and all those complex things and so uh, one thing I want to say ab about the project I'm working on which is called a child's guide to war.com you can look up the website is I'm trying to start this in the US but then I'm talking to people about hopefully taking it up in other countries um, there's somebody in Israel who said we need this there's this kind of ongoing identity, hatred, war going on uh, in our part of the world, in Rwanda, um, in a number of countries. So I think if we listen to our children, think about the impact on, on our children, think about what do we want to be teaching them? What are the civics lessons? And, and I have to say this conversation has been so meaningful to me to actually sit in a respectful environment and talk about the, the incredible, is difficult issue of killing. That doesn't happen at these meetings. And to be here with a soldier and an Iraqi and the mother of a soldier and all of you, I just, I think good for us that we're doing this. And I think we can do it in other conflict zones. Does anybody else want? Oh, yes. In the front of Powerful Peace, not I, I didn't bring any books to sell, but I can't strongly enough recommend it because the, the chapter, the opening chapter, or before the chapters begin, I wrote a letter, a one-page letter called An Open Letter to Veterans and Recruits. And I said, you will be scarred in your body, mind, heart, and soul to become a soldier. Or you have become scarred in body, mind, heart, and soul. Uh, this is not even a chapter. I wrote that and I said, this needs to get out there. People need to hear this. The vets need, you know, pass it to a vet, pass it to a vet. Because they come back thinking about ragheads from wars. That's not okay. That's not healthy. That's not good for our country, for any other country, for the people, on the, for the people in our country. Um, and so along those lines, I also opened up with this shocking revelation. When I, the first words in Powerful Peace are, when I was growing up in the Navy back in the mid-80s, female service members stripped nude on our base club stages and competed to be the hottest stripper. This is Army, Navy, and Air Force women. To be the hottest all-nude stripper among a bunch of screaming male soldiers, sailors, and airmen. Think forward 10, 15 years to tailhook and the great right-sizing of dignity and respect across the genders, which by no means is complete, any more than race relations are, are fixed in America. 
there is absolutely progress on both those issues. And so that issue is massive and it's still, it's, it's, it's a residual, it's like if you will, there's a memory or a flavor or a, a residual scent of um, degradation of females within the US military. It exists, I'm calling it what it is. And there's a hard response to it from authorities saying we have to stop doing this. And the complexity again of getting down to the war zones itself and when men are in a combat environment, the women are in a combat environment where I've been, I mean we, we you know, in these bases, uh, these rapes, uh, sexual assaults, um, attempted rapes are, have happened, I'm not saying are happening, of course they're still, they always will, but it was, uh, there's a massive rash of it when it was kind of uncontrolled because everybody's focusing on the war, part of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan during the, the OOs, uh, up to 08, 09, and 10. So it's, it's like everything else, it's complex. Yeah, it's it's complex. complex, but it's, it is absolutely a residual aspect of our culture of degradation of females. So I want to give Katama, uh, would you like to say anything as we sort of wrap up or um, about our conversation here? Um, I would just re-emphasize, uh, like uh, in, in certain countries, war or the history, how history touch upon uh, war is, um, is illustration of war as it's a game of win and a game of uh, always a defensive game. Uh, we, it's, I think it's real time to revisit how we are illustrating war in, in our history books. And I would re-emphasize like uh, uh, illustrating war as, um, as is, and, and uh, whether it, it is offensive or defensive war regardless. But let's not just talk about war uh, as if it's um, a game to win, but let's touch upon uh, what's beyond war. And let's, let's be frank about what we are teaching um, uh, the different generations about our country achievements, regardless where, uh, where we, uh, and how we did those achievements, but it's, it's, it's time to be honest about illustrating war as a war and illustrating the importance of um, um, uh, lesson learned of, of those wars. And uh, that's, that's the message we wanna communicate to the different generation. We don't wanna, um, um, different generations to think as, uh, to think of war as the first tactic to um, um, to com to convince people or to convene people about their um, um, ideology or their policy or their development uh, vision. Let's not push them towards that type of thinking. Um, uh, I, I've seen war not just in Iraq, in in, in Libya, and in, in many countries. They think of war as a game on their smartphones. And they think that war on, on the battlefield, it's, it's just like you know, uh, using um, a, gun, um, uh, a gun toy. And okay, yes, I might kill someone and he might come back uh, alive again and we can continue this game. It's not that. Once you kill someone, he's not gonna be here anymore and you have to live with it for the entire um, 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 life that you're gonna live. Once you're gonna, um, uh, once you're gonna live war, you have to really communicate what, what, whatever you experience, whether you are a soldier who, 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 who stood up to defend his country, to, de to defend the honor of the women in, in his country, or to defend um, the honor and, and the survival of, uh, of a human um, uh, 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 overseas, but just tell them about the entire story of war. Tell them about your kids, how they suffered. Tell them about um, um, the taxpayer, what they paid, and how they lived, and tell them about the fears that they uh, lived through, and tell them and bring back the stories of the kids and, and, and the society you try to defend and you try to protect. Bring it back to your own community and tell them, like, look, we have to stop calling, like, 
all Afghans and all Iraqis and all Libyans as our enemies. They're not. Part of them, they were our enemies, but not all of them. It's time to shift the game. Be once we shift the game, when we, we're gonna shift the game is when we decide to tell the truth, is when we decide to be honest with ourselves, is when we decide to learn of our, uh, from our, le our own lessons and from, from our own experience and teach the lesson that we learn and pass it to others honestly. Because um, I don't think you want your kids, and I was impressed, uh, one of the kids, he said, I have my own future plans and I don't wanna miss it. And the other one said that, I don't wanna have my kids to live what I live. This is <laughs> my decision, is that I lived in a war, but I don't want my kids uh, to live uh, the, the exact same feeling every single day that you're gonna die in, in, in a harsh way. That's the type of message um, it's time to communicate and it's time to teach to our new generation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>